Uh, we are in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum and Veterans Research Center in Saratoga Springs, New York. Ma'am, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? My name is Lydia Bazaar, actually Lydia Saniv Bazaar. I, my parents' name was Saniv. And I was born at, at this particular time in Poland. It was in 1928, and family used to own the, in, the, in, in Carpathians, we used to own the oil fields, mm -hmm. very known area, and uh, it used to be, at this time, the petroleum was sold to Flagler, and then later on to Rockefellers. Mm -hmm. uh, my schooling as a child was uh, actually still just beginning of the schooling I have there, but at 1939 was announcing the war when the German invaded Poland. First thing they did, it's bomb our city. Mm -hmm. And you were about 11 years old then? I was maybe, t yeah. 10, mm -hmm. 10, 11 years old. So what happened, uh, this was, you know, just any bomb on any city is very treacherous. But being that this was oil fields, it created just enormous, uh, enormous fires. And I lost my, one of my very good friends and her father got killed as mm -hmm. a result of the bombing. Now, entrance of Germans were very short. They kind of came, stay very short time, kind of didn't have time to, to, shake up the, to shake up the country <laughs> for any reason, and then the Russians arrived. Now, at this time, the Russians stayed for two years, mm -hmm. and probably this was one of the scariest times in my life. But immediately after a few months, they start picking up the people, people talking on the streets with each other. They would take them apart and want them to talk what they were talking about. And of all of a sudden, they start maybe in a year after, they start coming with a regular train, not uh, passenger train, but just mm -hmm. like uh, a one of those big this, and they would pick up the people and the whole family unannounced. They drive to your home, they pick you up, you don't know whatever you have chance to grab, mm -hmm. they put you on a train and off you go to Siberia. Now, now your family, did your entire family survive that, that initial bombing attack? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, we did. I have a brother, the only this, I have a brother from my mother's first marriage. After her husband died, she married my father. And he's seven years older than I am. So at this time, we were kind of, you know, everything was new. Mm -hmm. We live quiet life. All of a sudden, those incidents are scary incidents. And they are not just regular incidents. They kind of touch very much on life itself. Mm -hmm. You're going to live, you're going to die. Where are you going? When the Russians come in, they took all our family, 30 people, they took to Siberia. Did they, did they come in and take your family's took, possessions? They to? took, on the beginning they just come and say, get your things, you're leaving. Mm -hmm. And whatever you can grab, whatever you can put on, that's all what you're leaving with. And what, for this reason, I remember all those two years, they used to dress me three pair of socks, and this was every night I slept full closed. 
but the entrance to the, our home was kind of like a long entrance, long road. So anytime somebody by mistake, some truck, you know, regular truck would come in and just dump you on in there. One day when they were taking, they took my father, three brothers and their family, they, oh, uh, they took them and grandmother escaped and ran to her house. And she said, I'm going to stay with you. And we were very happy with it. But my father, he was, you know, he was not afraid to see what really is happening. He was mm -hmm. concerned for his brothers. So he walked to the train, but they wouldn't take him. Not that he wanted to give himself up, mm -hmm. but they had a list exactly who was they taking. And they asked this, where is the grandmother? You know, my grandmother. And naturally, you cannot lie to them, but mm -hmm. anything you say wrong, they can shoot you. Life mm -hmm. is such a, such mm -hmm. a little thing to them. So she says, they say, she tell her she has to come, but we go, you see what we can do. Naturally, she returned it back. Interesting, they didn't take us. My, to mention to you are uh, the Borislav, the city I'm talking about, is uh, very, uh, being petroleum was big thing for a city as such. And a lot of population was the Jewish population, mm -hmm. but business, a good businessman, they came, so there were a lot of, so my father was handling my grandfather estates that was the biggest oil estate at this point in Poland and ours. And as a result of it, he was very connected with Jewish people. Now, you have to understand that Jewish people at the time already knew what was happening all over the world mm -hmm. with the Jewish situation. I, you cannot blame them. They have to attach themselves someplace. They cannot go with Germans, but you're going to hear pretty soon what happened to them. And they knew already what could happen to them. But still, it sounded so unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So what happened, they... What happened, they must in some way shield. I mean, they were already in Russian, uh, so to say, government, city government. They had a higher position mm -hmm. than anybody else. But Russian understood too that they are scared of German, so they used them in different position, uh, you know, in a government of the city. We never knew, but possibly this what happened. That's the reason they didn't touch our four of us. The Russian didn't take us to Siberia. Now, of all of a sudden, they're becoming change of the change of the hands. Now, now, approximately what year was this? I mean, we're talking, they were two years, 1939. So we're talking 40, 40, 41, 42, something in this vicinity. Okay. So now what happened, of all of a sudden, the German coming and taking over again this territory. Before the Russians left, there was indescribable event what happened in this city and other cities. In fact, this day, the priest's son came to visit my brother that was in, in school already in, in Lviv, it's a city that he was in college there. He came in to visit him, and on the way back, 
In fact, I walk with them a little way till my brothers say, go home. But he spent all day with us. But the city was under tremendous scrutiny of, of Russians leaving. Say, after they left, my brother returned back home, but after they left, there where they have, so to say, NKVD, KGB, uh, this, there were full of sellers, not killed, but murdered young people, and this boy was one of them. Once he came to the center of the city, they picked him up. The young girls, young students, had hair, you know, cut off this, hair pulled way back, breast cut off. You know, it wasn't like I shoot you, but they murdered them before this happened. I mean, it was experience just to think about it. This, uh, the streets were laid out with all those young people and some older people were cut into. It was, and the parents were looking to find them and bring them, you know, to bury them and so on and so forth. Now, why did they do this? Because they were students? No. I mean, the youth is usually our protesters in mm -hmm. any country. Mm -hmm. Students have, can change the country. Uh, when they make uprise, there is different uprise, you know, family, man is married, he's not gonna stick his neck to, to wind up in jail or be mm -hmm. killed. He has a family to mm -hmm. think about. But students always is a different thing. I can name many countries what happened mm -hmm. and how the students achieve or independence or what they were fighting for. It was granted to them. I mean, when they left, it was, it was like, dear God. We heard from my aunt that they picked her up with a just newborn child. They wind up in Siberia, and when they dumped it in the winter time, they dug the hole in a mountain and were living in this hole. We say when from Kolhosp, Kolhosp is the, when they cultivated all the farms, they made it like one big farm and they called this Kolhosp. And there when the chicken would run off and this, they this, how they share between those people. They had a nothing, hardly any clothes, but what do you take when you say in five minutes, get ready, you're mm -hmm. leaving. Anyway, uh, we thought, Wow, what a great thing to see the Germans coming. Mm -hmm. They must be more civilized. Something like this would never happen. I mean, strange thing, what happened. It was all over hard to describe. Oh, by the way, they took, the Russians took my cousin, my father, oldest brother, son, and they boiled him in a kettle. You know, to describe to anybody such a happenings, you are so scared, you are so fearful. On top of this, when Russian games, you couldn't go to church. I had a, as a child, I liked the Godmother altar in our church, and even when the church was closed, I still used to, they had a back door that went to cellar and I could come there and pray to Mother God there. Till today, I have this picture. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I called my, uh, my family back home and they made a, made a photo of, of this altar. Anyway, so when German came, People, politically, were so lost. You know, like now, Russian accusing us that we were collaborators with, with uh, Germans. 
It isn't true. We are not any collaborators. Only where do you go? Mm -hmm. Those people we already learned two years and they demolished us. They closed the churches, universities. Six were happening, just unbelievable. Interesting part, but it kind of for a while got very quiet till they established themselves, till their true identity were coming to the picture. At this time, we first realized that there was sort of so, so to call pogrom. And we never realized in the beginning, I mean, still even going to school, how could it, how could it be so that so they can take you from your home and just take you away and kill you? For what? Regular, just the families. I'm not talking some political people or something like this. Just average human being to be exposed to something like this. Anyway, we, uh, at this time, I start going, this was like, high school, this is already coming, I'm almost going toward the end of uh, German occupation. They would come and search the homes, they searched our home for whatever they could take, mm -hmm. you know, or you have some uh, uh, cow or, or pig or something, they would try to take this away from you. But when they announced the program, program, we see the police is walking, but our house was very far from the street. But we could see the line of people with little, you know, like not luggages, but cloth tied mm -hmm. up. Jewish people we knew, you know, they have those hats and this. And the women are walking streets we figured they must have just, you know, there used to be so-called ghetto, ghettos. They were in Germany, they were all over the world, where, Germany, where the uh, Jewish people have to live together. Mm -hmm. This was barricade and everything. They can, can come out, you know. You know, I always say, we have so many geniuses in Jewish, Jewish nation. And the reason for it was they could never step out much out of this place, youth or anything. And their most time was devoted to study. Those parents spent days and nights sitting and teaching the children. That's the reason the so to say, evolution produced it, this kind of people, you know, but they were, you know, like uh, regular students, oh, you just go to school, do your work, come back home, and that, this is it. Mm -hmm. There was continuous this input the parents put on those children. So we realized that there were ghettos, but in our city, there wasn't. There was too much of business people, you know, Jewish, very mm -hmm. wealthy business people that were dealing with oils, with uh, refineries, and, and so on and so forth. So what happened when we saw those people walking on the streets like this? We say, dear God, it's unbelievable. But Maybe even I didn't know, just my parents knew at the time. I used to, and my brother used to take the piano lesson in ve from very famous piano professor, Dr. Professor Charlotte. In fact, his son, Charlotte, you know on television was this bushy hair? Oh, Gene Charlotte? Gene Charlotte. <clears throat> it has to be his son. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I used to come in for a lesson, 
He was younger, said I. He used to have this bushy hair, and his mother used to have hair like this. And his father was almost like totally blind. His hair were very stiff like this. And when he would be sitting like that, having lunch, and I'm playing, he would say, not third finger, not third. This kind of quality. He was a composer. Mm -hmm. In fact, his father and him came to America for recitals and so on and so forth. Uh, some phenomenal, phenomenal music they, they did. Anyway, the parents didn't want anybody to know, but we were hiding Professor Charlotte in our house. So, a couple of days apparently they knew it. I, as a child, they wouldn't tell you, but the home was a very big home. But there were maids, there were a man, stable man, you know, so somebody must have seen that he was there. So as this pogrom is going on and they are taking and they are uh, bringing people, at this point they are marching someplace. The woman runs into her, her house with a little banner on her this Jewish identification, mm -hmm. and she starts talking, and we realize why she's there. She doesn't want to be home. Where they walking to the houses and pulling the people out, and in a couple minutes. There are Germans with the machine guns walking in our house and say, you hiding Jews. Apparently, somebody from help reported that we were hiding, we were hiding Professor Shaw. But here is this woman, and she say, no, I'm a, I'm a neighbor. I live right here. I come in to borrow something. I, you know, she had a like little cup. I come in to borrow. I forgot what it was at the time. Flower or something. I mean, they look it. Probably this is what they talking hiding. And she say, "Come on with me. I show you where I live. I just come in to borrow something. I, I'm not. They not hiding me." They took us all outside. It was my father, my mother, my brother wasn't home. He was in Lviv in college. And, and this, this woman, she was a little woman, kind of a little bit taller than I was. And she was holding my hand and my mother, my father was staying in the line. He, they still questioning her and where is your son, and where is your husband, and you know, she say, I'm not married, I, you know, and so on and so forth. Then he looked, they staying with those, with those guns on, and then they say, you're coming with us. She say, no, I'm not going nowhere. Without, she finished the sentence, pow. She fell down and she pulled me holding my hand very tight. She pulled me right with her. I fell on top of her, and my parents thought that I was killed too. So my mother started crying and this, and they just say, we not, you be lucky, we're not doing nothing to you. And, and they left. As you look at from our house, there was a, oh, maybe four or five miles was the hill. And we see the bulldozer digging the hole, going steadily through this mountain like this. And all of a sudden, they brought all those people right there to the top. And 
you just heard the machine gun. Da -da 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 -da. So I asked my parents, what is this? What they doing? He said, don't worry, there is, you know, say some worrying. Mm -hmm. How I'm, how scared I am. It was almost, you know, it was, as I remember my childhood, it was continuously fear. It took me, when I came to this country, many years to lose this fear, you know, but it was always kind of like uncertainty, mm -hmm. anxiety, something will happen to us. And so when they killed those people, it was, and this keep on continuing, all kind. But they knew that the Ukrainians didn't have a place to go. We couldn't go to Russians, but we already have a history of 300 years what the Russians did to us. You know, took our country, kept, and till today we having a repeat right now. And so when all of a sudden war starts, and the Russians start coming closer, it was nothing else for us was to do. In fact, my father was not going. He's gonna stay, uh, we gonna face this thing. Where are we gonna go, my father said. We used to go to resort in the mountains. It was on border of Poland. Uh, Krenica, it was very famous resort. And what, what was about, we felt we would be saved there. You know, the war is not there. You know, you, you cannot think any other way. Mm -hmm. So my uncle ran to our house in the morning and said to my father, Mikola, for intelligent men, you stupid. What is more important? your life or all your possessions. What gonna happen to your kids staying here? You're gonna be, in two months, you're gonna be in Siberia and you're never gonna see the light of coming back home. So my father, my mother start to cry and this and this. And he said, you have nothing to lose, at least go and you can always come back. When everything turns all right, you can come back. I remember the German big truck, army truck, like a convoy was going someplace, and my uncle was, was they were officers were staying in his house, and he say, okay, take your whole family and we take you with us and we, keep on going. Then when we have to drop you off 200, 300 miles away from here, you're gonna be on your own. This is exactly what happened. My mother ran to me and said, Lydia, take the luggage and put whatever clothes you can find, put it there. You know, as a child, scared, crying, this, I went to Dr. Professor Shalit, music from a, pia <laughs> from a piano, my doll, my, no, hardly any clothes. So we went on this truck and we continued for another maybe two, three hundred miles and they say, that's it. But invasion was moving mm -hmm. pretty fast. Now let me ask you, did the professor stay, stay there or he didn't come with you, did he? Professor Shallot? Oh, Professor Shallot, this already, we lost the total track. They were moving at this point, at this point, Jewish people were out of mm -hmm. the city. We didn't have no communication, but your life was at stake. Mm -hmm. Being, when Professor Shallot heard that they shot this woman, you know, at the time I explained to you. Mm -hmm. 
He's saying, I cannot endanger your family life anymore. I have to go back home. And from this point, everything was wiped off. This was kind of already coming to the end of, Ger of, uh, of the, their German occupation. Mm -hmm. the, they already knew they, they were forced to move, to move out too. So at this point when they dropped us out of this German truck, my father said, how are we going to continue farther to get there where we were, the resort we always used to go with Nana and governess and all the, all for two months in the summer. Oh, we know, we could stay in this villa, in this villa. They bought everybody, those families that were with us, they all bought horses and a wagon, you know, a regular wagon. I never forget, I was laying on back and my feet were, you know, bouncing on the floor of the road as we were driving. At this time, no food. We bought, I remember we bought some pig or something, and they cut this up and put it in a barrel, wooden barrel. But in a couple of weeks, when we got closer to the mountains, it started smelling very badly. At night, we slept under wagon, but in the morning, the dew would make you totally wet. Mm -hmm. And I never forget when they opened, the, this was to me, it was funny, when they opened this, uh, this barrel, all meat was with maggots. Mm -hmm. And they were taking this meat to the water and wash there and then roasting. Still, this is what we ate. And once it's washed and roasted, it was, you know, it was safe to eat. So this is how we continue. Finally, we were coming with this wagon, sleeping under this, next to the river every night, following some river, I forgot that. Till all of a sudden, the German got wind of us. You know, this whole caravan of wagon with the people was sleeping on it, you know, they figure we're gonna do something with them. So we were close to Oberslesia. They put, they, I remember my father sold the horse and gave the, or did we give it away the thing? They put us on a train and we wind up in Oberslesia, in Chinitz. Chinitz uh, was the city, a factory, 40 miles long steel factory. They brought us to those barracks and the room, a little room, like maybe 12 by 16, mm -hmm. there were the bunk beds made out of wood, you know, like for the army. I, do, I don't think the army had a dead bed. Okay. And what happened, we would say would, you get ba ba the assignment, what bunk you're sleeping on, and in this room around the walls, there would be like five, six families. At night, you take the blanket and attach to two, two nails there for, so you can sleep, but other people may be still not sleeping, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In the morning, after the assignment, they send us to the kitchen and give you like army, silver, aluminum, this, and you get scoop of peas maybe scoop of potato and some maybe piece of bread. This is it. 
And I, I remember my mother always saying, you know, I'm not hungry, Lydia, you eat this. But she was so worrying so that I was so skinny and growing so tall. Mm -hmm. And till later in life, I found out why she wouldn't eat. Anyway, in the mornings, they would take us to this 40 mile long steel factory. Everybody is going inside, even I. I'm not with my parents, my mother someplace else, my father someplace else. My brother was on a, uh, this, those cranes, mm -hmm. those big cranes. Now what were they making in this factory? All different parts, different parts for whatever it was. At the time, I don't know, but 40 miles, it's a big place. Mm -hmm. When they put me in a truck, separate me with the parents and take me someplace, I would drive for a while to get there and coming back home to meet my parents at the gate, I would travel for a while again. So when we wind up there, I remember I had a job that was machine and had a, like a drill. Mm -hmm. And I would drill with this machine the hole in a little steel like this, six steel. It was like a screw almost. And there was nobody around me. I was just doing this there. And next to me was uh, like a little big mountain of, what would you call this, vata, glass vata. You now, know. now, how old were you at this point? I mean, I was probably 13, mm -hmm. going on, on 14 maybe. I would say I should be already there. But I was very tall for my age. Anyway, so we got to there, and at this point, at this point, you know, you feel at least you have a job, you have a place, mm -hmm. and the Russians are still very far away from you. But we heard the stories that Russians are giving big money to get us back. You know, they would pay anything to get all those people that escape to get them back to the to 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 Russia, so to say. I don't think they're gonna take you back home. Anyway, we at this point, you know, it wasn't bad. This job was all right. One day, of all of a sudden, we hear like forty planes on top of us in a formation. You know, everybody is. The sound of it was so alarming. It was such as, you know, so many planes driving together. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the bombs are start coming like, like candies coming from heaven. And there was no place to run. Nobody asked you what's gonna happen to you. But I, the reason I tell you there was like Look, cotton, like uh, steel cotton, big mountain next to me. I used to dive right inside there. How could it anything help me? But as a child, I didn't know, you know, still a young person, I didn't know what to do with myself at this point. The sad part was to go at night and see to meet your parents. I say life places on fire all over, but still you have to work. Soon the bombing stop and you're not on fire, you continue doing what you're doing. Anyway, uh, we were lucky. When I, come, when I would come back to this, my father and mother would be there and my father, my brother was there. But 
At this point, already so many months, no food, no proper food, no proper hygiene. Uh, we all develop fleas. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember this very tight comb that I, I, had a, I had a mop of hair. And I remember always, all night, just combing this thing out. And then my mother say, put it in a like little cut, a little dish. And then to kill those things, they would put something on it. Some I, I forgot what it was. Or I saw some people with the matches lighting up. Mm -hmm. It was, but you know, for some reason, as a young person. You don't see this as very bad. My parents, I could see this tremendous fear in their eyes looking at me. But to a young person, it was like adventure. What's going to happen tomorrow? Anyway, we were there, I would say, probably two or two and a half months working. Then. Now, were your parents, like, working in the factory, too? Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes. But we, the only thing at night, we come to the same room, mm -hmm. sharing with another 20, 30 people, and to go to canteen when they give you this, this whatever you call meal. And at this point, my father come and priest from our city was in this group too. Very, very, very lovely, educated man and very, uh, very concerned what is happening, you know, from all kinds of standpoint, what is happening to people and how they value the God. Why is it this happening to us? And try to talk to everybody and so on and so forth. So what happened, of all of a sudden, my father come one evening home and say, we have to run. The Russians are very close already coming to Chinitz. At this point, where are we going to go? There is big Germany in front of us. My father spoke many languages. He spoke Latin, Greek, you know, he went to prep school when uh, back still in Poland. And he was very educated, so they asked him to go to Bürgermeister of the Chinitz and ask, or he would put us, attach us on a train to some army convoy or something, and then just to get us out. Naturally, we have to give him everything we had, whatever jewelry, whatever money, whatever, any possession. We all got this package for him. I never forget, like my father at night went to see him, and we figured maybe they're going to take all this from him and shoot him or, or something, you know, you just sit and weigh this all, all night long. My father came back and he said, we have a couple, we have a four wagons to attach to army convoy. Mm -hmm. And it's going, it's going to Regensburg. And so this is January. January of 45, was it? I would say 44. 44? I would say possibly 44. Okay. So we got, we got on this train, and there is no place, you know, like, no place to sit, no place to lie. In the middle, there is little oven like a little steel sink with it going through the roof, and it's January. 
No banks, no nothing. This is just say they gave us this. I remember whatever we had it, sort of called luggage or whatever it was. This was where you sit all day long, when you sleep all night long, around this oven. No place to go to bathroom. Forget it. When train stops, it's snow. You're afraid to jump off. They don't tell you we're gonna stop here and you can do whatever you wanted. That was no way. You just, when you open this door from this oven, we were like Negroes, just show the white teeth, you know, all the smoke. Mm -hmm. We were covered with it. So we were on this train almost months. This is genuine. And it was, you get, just every, every bone is sore, but you never know how you fell asleep. And, you know, this was the worst part. Not to lie down on the floor, but it's very cold. To sit on this little package you have all day long and all night long it is unbelievable. So, in one night we wind up in the Regensburg. This when the famous, but the train, they have underground places. So the train, the army train drove right underground and there is a bombing. This is this famous bombing when they leveled the Regensburg, one of the biggest cities, a well, German city, they almost leveled. So when we woke up, I mean, the bombs were just, you know, you get used to it, to those things. You know, you heard the bombs coming. This is like, you know, like uh, lightning. Oh, it's far there. Oh, it's close here. Mm -hmm. This approximately how you, uh, how you analyze how far you are from danger. So what happened, we woke up in the morning and then they say we cannot go with the army anymore. There is the wagon. What are you going to do? And then they ask you, where would you like to go to work? And at this time, my father thought, spoke German and knew, you know, knew the geography and everything. They say, he say, we would like to go to Würzburg. The reason he chose the Würzburg, but Würzburg was famous for Red Cross hospitals, a huge building and on a roof, big Red Cross. My Is that father, where that big castle was too? Würzburg? In Würzburg, yeah, yeah. Okay. And this is the winery country, you know, mm -hmm. the mountains were growing wine and uh, doing all kinds of uh, wines and so on and so forth. But besides, it was a very hospital type of a, you know, so everybody felt you protected there. Nobody got to bomb the city as such where there are sick people in those hospitals. When we arrived, were you surprised? Whole Würzburg was on fire. We left the Regensburg, and apparently those guys that were bombing Regensburg went to Würzburg and knocked this out. You know, at this point you get used to it, to bed, to hunger, to cold, to dirt, you know. It is, it is parked like, it is already part of your life. And now there's gonna be another day. Let's hope everything, uh, let's hope the snow melts and it gets warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so at this time when we got to Würzburg, the Germans had to do something with us. There's a bunch of people staying on a station and where are we going from there? So they got us into the school and they start separating us, 
you know, different corners, you are so and so, what can you do, what can you do? My father say, why don't we say we are farmers? This way, when we wind up on a farm, we're going to have food to eat. So let us, you know, we love to do this work to be a farmer. So all over again, it took like a week till all this thing, and all of a sudden, they got my family, and the priest was with, with some other people that we knew. We were all going to Arzberg. It is upper part of Germany that is quite famous for porcelain make factories and make porcelains and so and so. But we are going to the farm. So as we arrived there all over again, we wind up in some schools uh, setting till finally people come. The people that have no farms come in to examine us you know, what kind of people we are. And so the, the young guy come in and he was a doctor. And he say, my grandmother has a farm like right on the border of Slovakia and this. And she lives alone and she old woman. And I think you would be very good as a family for this farm. So here we back on the train. Oh, no, no, they come in, pick us up with their truck and brought us to this farm. This farm was so neglected and so dirty. And everybody has had assignment. My father, my brother has to work on the fields. I'm to clean the whole place and make sure the wood is to fire up the whole house all the time. And the place was just so dirty. And there was no soap. I never forget till today, I have to think about it. They take the straw, you know, like from a wheat straw, mm -hmm. and you soak it this in the water and creates it like a soapy calamity. Mm. And finally, you know, it bothered me, but I, we have to live in this farm. I cleaned this place all up. And the woman, his grandmother was a, like 300 pounds woman. She could not do much. And she was in her 80s or 90s. And she was always, wow, you can really clean. And I felt, you, you know, I want to clean so we can live in a clean, it, it really bothered me. Even, I tell you what, when still when we were home, when all the help left and there was nobody, I was doing all, all the jobs. Even then, and it was good preparatory for what I wind up when we wind up on a farm. Now, at this point, you know, we felt so safe. There was a food, there was a milk, there was a, you know, we, we could nourish ourselves. And hard work was the least when you are worried. So we are in a little village, only four farms. To go to town, you go up a hill, and there is little, you know, not, not significant, you, call, you, you don't even call town. It's like a little, few farmhouses and few stores and so on and so forth. So I always was elected to go there to get the bread or whatever supplies needed going up a hill. And so it was such a venture to go by myself way there to the city to get the stuff. Finally, I got some bicycle I was doing. But of all of a sudden, the Americans are coming. 
You cannot, you don't have radio, you cannot find out news, there is no newspaper coming. You live in such a ignorance and such a, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, did the, uh, did the Germans tell you to, f to be afraid of the Americans at all? There was nobody to talk to except this old woman. We were workers. Mm -hmm. We were farm workers at the time. There was nobody that could tell you anything about anything. But there weren't any German soldiers around that you saw? Right now, there is nothing. Mm -hmm. Of all of a sudden, one day they decided that in our farm, in our farm where, when four of us are working, there are going to be, there are 20 or 30 officers coming to stay. And my father say, why those officers are not on the front? Why are they coming to stay in a little village like this? Like four farms and, and there is, you know, insignificant. Why is they coming? Something is cooking up. And they sent me to, to get the bread this day. Mm -hmm. And I remember, it's something the officers already come in. My mother kind of smeared me up, kind of really, you know, I'm a very tall girl for my age. And she said, go to go to store there. Coming back from store, I hear some shooting, but I don't think much about it. Um, as I'm passing by, I see the body of a young man laying there. But I figured maybe he's sleeping. I better go home quick. I came back and my father, and I tell my father and mother what I saw. She says, something is happening. There is like underground already opposition is coming in. And maybe they caught up this young man and killed him so he wouldn't spread the news or it happened at night and they, you, you don't know. So every day that those officers are staying, say in the kitchen, my mother and I serving and cooking for them. And the window it's like this, open the, the, the door goes, the table, this big table is going way out there facing the window. And the window is open, it's already spring. And as we serving the meal, of all of a sudden, we see the jeep coming. In a jeep, there are four guys sitting, and they don't look German. But this is American jeep with four guys. Those officers, not making any commotion, still eating. They put the machine gun on a desk and when just did 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 did, did. kill the guys right there. My father say, listen, Americans must be already on a hill, on this city where I went for a bread. They gonna burn the village. This was apparently some important, this was not just the army saying, this was some important guys they sent to, to check it out, the area. So what happened? We don't know where to go to sleep. The, the Germans are looking at us and we just like nothing to it. I'm outside chopping my wood, branches for the heat and right away cleaning start, you know, clean everything, prepare for another meal for them. They don't talk to anybody. So even my father speaks German. They don't talk to him either. They very quiet and just doing. They took the whole stable with the hay and they slept all there. 
So my father finally got us together and say, listen, they're going to burn, they're going to burn this village to the ground, Americans. Let's, during the night, run to Americans. And we are like flat and evenly going this, and on a hill should be Americans. We wait till midnight. We dress ourselves, you know, kind of, it's still spring accordingly mm -hmm. to it, and we start one by one, quietly, when we felt everybody is asleep, we quietly start running there. We don't know at this point, but we fed the Germans at noon. We didn't see them at night, so maybe they are gone. But we figure Americans don't know or they gone or not. They probably gonna still wanna be sure they lost it for men now. They gonna be sure or is this they gonna attack the village and burn it or something. All right, let me stop you here. I have to change okay. tapes. We are going to run to Americans over the night. So it's only four of us, and we slowly got Ada through the barns and everything hiding from the old woman that she doesn't see us and doesn't call somebody. And we are slowly going through the fields, through the middle, and there is like little rain, not much to call heavy rain, just a little rain coming down. And as we are progressing to middle of the fields that is growing potatoes, I think, there are little bunches, of all of a sudden we hear the machine gun from German, from Americans coming at us. So my father say, lay on the ground, Dig the hole with, with your hands and put your head right in the soil down. You can almost like feel it, like the air over your head going. And this is not stopping. Mm -hmm. Little from Germans, like little shot here and there would come. But we are talking already after midnight, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. So the shooting keep on going, you know, and my father said, don't move, just stay there. We should have never gone. We could have been killed already. So as I'm laying down, and you don't know, you don't lift your head, but you're afraid you're going to lose your head. <laughs> it is so funny, I feel like a knife, somebody put it in my back, and I look at, I turn my head and I look it up like this, and there is a soldier in a helmet with a bagnet in my back. And he yells to other, this is child here, you know, and more, more, those were Americans. Mm -hmm. And naturally they got us, ask us what is happening in the farm. They still fighting, say, stay here now. And, but we the ones that created this fire, us walking to mm -hmm. them. So what happened, they got us back into the farm. And our work continued, we need to eat. Nobody going to feed us, but those American soldiers, they saw the, you know, probably left sister like me back home and stuff like this. So they see me chopping the wood, doing heavy work. They all wanted help. And they, they cut enough wood, <laughs> you, you know, I didn't have to do it. 
and they would bring, you know, like cans of some meat mm -hmm. or something like this, and they were very, very nice to us. But of all of a sudden, people all over were in such a trouble, caught that so they're going to be caught under Russians. But Slovakia and Czechoslovakia already is being taken by Russians. But we are so happy. We are on the side of American, that this little river that goes through is division. So Russian cannot do nothing to us. So all of a sudden the guy come in and say, people so-and-so, the good friends of my family, are already under Russians, kind of hiding, still no time to find out who's who. Can they somehow come here? They cannot travel on the road, but all the roads are being inspected and asking who's who, where going, why not going, and so on. So, what happened, he's, uh, uh, they say, I'm telling the, oh, one guy spoke Polish, mm -hmm. he was Polish, and I say to him, I have a family there, I wish I could get them, I mean, they kind of relations were to us too, I wish we could get them back here. He said, Lydia, don't worry. We're going to go with the tank there. So I have to go with him to recognize the people, to find them. You know, you could have gone with the tank in the middle of the town and it was okay. And right now, the Russian and Americans were still friends, mm -hmm. you know. So we drove there. We got their belongings all in this tank. We brought those people back and then other people start asking for other people. And next thing I was going every day, usually an afternoon, I was going with a tank to Czechoslovakia to bring more people. I was like, you know, in my young age, I was like an agent. <laughs> <laughs> agent to bring the people back to safety. <laughs> anyway, all of a sudden, it started getting a little bit, we already under Americans. We don't have to stay in this farm where we can get the job in the city, you know. But this was like, oh, you wouldn't believe it, like old farms in nowhere. So we move in a city and my father start buying some porcelain that was very, very famous porcelain and start selling and making some money. There are some professors that escape from Poland like we did, Ukrainian, open like a schools. Hey, I'm losing, lost it for years now. No schooling, nothing. So there is schools open up and so on and so forth, but nothing major, you know, not established mm -hmm. like. Now, now this is right after the war. Right. Let, let, me, let me just go back a little bit and ask sure. you, when, when you heard about the death of Hitler what, and the war ended, was, was there a lot of celebration? No? Germans are still Germans. They are uh, respectful to their, you know, it, it almost, you know, the Hitler raised the young generation uh, that was so for Hitler. They were very well schooled. They were, you know, when you look at the German army, it was really pride to see their uniforms, their cleanness, their obe obedience, their everything. You know, he really, and they felt this Ibermenschen. You know, they are above anybody. 
-hmm. You know, they portray themselves that well. Even a lot of families suffer under Germans too. You know, uh, not everybody was for Hitler. Hitler created a lot of uh, his policies were not the policies of Germany. You know, this was a new, new field, new, but youth prevails. Mm -hmm. They, and they were so devoted to him. And they felt that they gonna conquer the whole world and nothing to it, you know. And for this reason, uh, Nobody celebrated Hitler. I mean, for a while, even, you know, finally we got some little radio in this little apartment with three other families. But, but the quality of your life, once the war ended, did it start to get better for you? Oh, as far, still, three family. There was like, uh, those people were be working on a farm their other son had a, like a, a restaurant mm -hmm. and on top there was one big room so three families that we feel we can live together you know peacefully and so on mm -hmm. so forth no small children and you know and so we move all together and live there in this in this little building till I mean, still, the, everything is smashed out, the city, the bombs, uh, uh, so much repairs still. But I tell you what, Ger German people are very unusual breed of people. You look at, in little town, now we are, come Saturday, or it's a doctor, lawyer, uh, a farmer or this, everybody comes and sweeps the road, very clean, very organized, and very obedient. It was a good example to see where the nation can raise themselves to some, uh, to some productive way of existence. Mm -hmm. You know, even you're down, but you still remain, you don't give up. Mm -hmm. You still remain the same way of daily routine and to be everything. And you respect, you respect your neighbor. You don't leave your side of the street dirty. And this kind of gives you feeling that everything is all right, that there wasn't war, <laughs> you know, everything is clean, everything mm -hmm. is organized, and so on and so forth. I tell you what, at this time there is war, and people, and armies, moving, trains, but my father speaks to me, and he say, we don't have nothing, we don't have money left, we cannot return back home, you need education in the worst way. So the only thing we knew, there were big camps of Ukrainian uh, displaced people mm -hmm. in Dachau. You know the Dachau, the oh, sure. famous no. this? They took over this Ukrainian, well, thousands and thousands of people move in there to live open the schools, open all kind of organization for the children, for learning, for dancing, for singing, to, to, to still promote the habits of the, their people. You know, not mm -hmm. to forget you in different country, you already not Ukrainian anymore. I say to my father, now I'm around 15 maybe, 14, 15, and my sister-in-law's sister was going to Dachau to visit somebody. I say to my father, I'm going to go with her and see how the school is there. Maybe we all can move there. 
I come into the camp and the camp is all filled up. They not taking nobody in. So I figure I have to figure on some way of surviving. So what I did, I say I'm lost. I'm lost from my parents. I don't have nobody, I'm on the street. Would you take me in? He said, do you know anybody there? There was my uncle, the first uncle. He's in this camp too. The room, 12 by 12, five families, everybody has a corner. There is no place even for me to put the bed. In the middle, there is a table. And I sleep under this table. I call home, I figure, then I try to get into the school. School, all the impossible to get in. So overflown with everything. My sister, sister is going back home and I say, you tell father, I'm doing very good. I'm already in high school. I have a place to live, to sleep. I'm sleeping under the table. And at night when I study, I put the lamp, I took the, my skirt tied here so everybody can sleep, and I put it like this, and there I'm studying. At night, or I go, you know, Dachau, when they would have those areas when you wash yourself and so on. So there is motorcycle staying there, belong to somebody. There would be another quiet place to sit and study. It was so tough. The only thing in this room, there was one wooden bench and one student was going to medical school <coughs> in Munich. And he say, when I'm not there, you can sleep on this bench, get off the floor. So finally I graduate mm. to sleeping on a hard bench with rolled up clothes for a hat and coat to cover myself. My father in two months came to visit and he got sick when he saw me. He say, what are you doing to yourself? I say, Father, what am I going to sit in this village looking through the window? I'm never, we never gonna, I'm never going to get no place. What am I going to be cleaning women there to survive? Anyway, of all of a sudden, the Dachau is coming to be closed. Now, now uh, were you staying in the old prison camp? Or right outside of the camp? And this, no, this is a Dachau camp. Right and in the camp. Right in the camp, there are the barracks. Yep. And those barracks are divided for living quarters, for a hall, uh, for studying, and uh, for, for different events, you know. This, but I don't know what it was there before but it's all fenced with wires. You didn't, you didn't know it was a death camp? No, but, but you not could, then. You could see the ovens there. No, nobody show you ovens. Those uh -huh. things are all closed and see. nobody sees them. The only thing you know, you live there in a the camp, you have the, you know, you go to eat to the area, you know, they give mm -hmm. you whatever. UNRWA. UNRWA used to supply the food for the... I mean, normally you get the horse's meat, so you're lucky, but you get can of it. The only thing after you eat, and it's cold, your mouth dry out, and it's like, you know, all the fat is all around your mouth, then mm -hmm. that's... Uh, but anyway, at least you have a meat on and off. So, of all of a sudden, they decided to divide this camp and send one part of the camp to Berchtesgaden, you know, where Hitler mm -hmm. used to have his own, to another 
camp, like army camp, you know, Orlik, as they used to call. And another one went to Mittenwald, the most two beautiful places in the world. When they brought us there at night on those trucks there and dispersed us all, it was almost unbelievable. There were four white mountains, you know, they call this Vatspan, the husband, wife, and this, right facing you. And you all surrounded by this beauty of those huge mountains. I say to myself, wow, the God took the pity on us from all this terrible thing, brought us in such a magnificent beauty. Anyway, right away, the professors still from Europe organized high schools, sports, everything. It was bad. I was assigned to live with another girl that she lost her parents someplace. And uh, mother and a daughter, one room. Wow, how lucky. You know, nice, clean, say very clean, nice. Uh, one daughter was the professor, daughter of a banker, the other, you know, upgraded families with, you know, knowing how to live properly, clean, and respectfully. So, what happened there? It was normal life. Normal life with little, just having very little. But study was unbelievable. It is, was such an enormous work to catch up for years. Mm -hmm. It was just like continuously in the books. Some kids that didn't care what happened were going, mountain climbing. The beauty was, you know, Hitler didn't choose his place, just nothing. Mm -hmm. The beauty was unsurpassable. It was, it was like only you can imagine in a dream. And those barracks was uh, brick barracks very, in fact, I painted a picture of it. It was very nice. Professors were all from top universities, you know, so we have the best schooling, the mm -hmm. best thing. And at this point to think, what are you gonna do next with your life? People talking, we're going to America, we're going to Australia, we're going to South America, we're going to Argentina, you know, everybody or knew somebody, in the meantime, we didn't know no one. Where to go, and who's gonna take us, and who's gonna send us a green card to come to this country? So one, oh, after I graduated there, already even camp was falling apart. Mm -hmm. Still maybe another year, and it's dispersed, everybody moved in different direction. I decided to go to Munich to medical school. Always loved medicine. Till today, I practice on him. And <laughs> you see, that's the reason he lives alone. And so what happened when I came there all over again? My parents still way in Arnsberg, you mm -hmm. know, way up there. And my father, you know, there is not phones we can talk to each other. My father say, when you write letter, I write letter as I take the notes in, in college. First letter, line, last, you know, quick. Mm -hmm. My father said, and my father was a calligraphical writer. You know, everything mm -hmm. was those proper. So he said to me, write shorted letters, but write so that I can read. <laughs> so anyway, in Munich, my father couldn't help me, nothing. I found somebody that wanted me to sell the steel brushes, mm -hmm. and I, I never forget, 
the snow was falling, not deep snow, but snow wet, no proper shoes, no coat, you know, kind of little, little cold. I'm walking from one store to the other trying to sell in Munich those steel brushes. But kind of some people were taking, just looking at me as a student, trying to survive. Okay, I will take two. I, then finally I got accepted to the dormitory that the, uh, was paid by the but Americans kind of supported this. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, one day, the guy walked up to me and said, I heard your name is Seniv. Uh, are you related to Mikola Seniv? I say, it's my father. He say, we went to prep school together in uh, Przemysl. Then I lost the track of him. He say, where are you going from here? I say, we don't have no one to ask us to come any place. He say, listen, I'm going to America. Soon I get there, I'm going to send you the papers. So all over again, the camps, before I switched to pharmacy to get the degree. I never liked the pharmacy, not in this country. There was just, you know, dishing out. The wise mm -hmm. would be a salesman. Uh, European pharmacy still at this then, you had it uh, all on back. You were manufacturing this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was totally different, the uh, pharmacy there. But anyway, so finally he did send us the visas and hardship of the camps when you are, you know, when you are sent through to come to this country. It's something, I live in Augsburg, I live in Stuttgart, <laughs> till finally they put us on this, uh, to Bremenhaven to come to this country. Now, did you come here as an entire family? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, I did. But uh, what happened, uh, you know, we came on a ship that was cargo ship. Mm -hmm. And we had one of the biggest storms. And the whole ship got so sick. I mean sick. In fact, my mother was with IV taking out. And they knew my medical background. I and one doctor were all, even personnel was all sick. We had a woman that got crazy, and I never forget, I only can give her shots when she was in a, uh, in a shower. And this was some journey, but coming to this country, this freedom. You know, when anybody says anything about America, I would scratch their eyes out. You don't know what it means to be free to say anything you wanted, express your opinion. Uh, nobody defend yourself on any cause. Have help, have understanding. This I don't remember since childhood. Mm -hmm. Everything's so terrible. Right now, I'm so upset what is happening in Ukraine, but it looks like we are turning back to communism. Through mistake and things like that, we, we lost the election to the guy that is Putin mm -hmm. under study. And in such a not even year, it's what it used to be when it was under, not, it, it was only like never changed, mm -hmm. still prosecution, all kind of prosecutions and everything. I'm involved, uh, we are involved with the oldest university there. 
we helped him at a time when there was the Orange Revolution and we helped the students that participated in it. You know, it was so beautiful without one, one bullet and we got independent Ukraine mm -hmm. and after five years to elect something like this. Right now there is such a demonstration, but I don't know. Or anybody can change anything. Uh, America is very, I mean, Obama is not making any comments. First thing I don't know, or he's politically that much wise, uh, what the Russia is all about. Still what it is. I don't think Russia ever changed. The Putin keeps it this way. Mm -hmm. Still, you cannot speak, you cannot say, life doesn't mean na nothing, uh, have the, uh, you know, any literary person to be shot or, uh, it's nothing. They don't like educated people, but those people can uprise and do something. So I don't know, right now, it's such a sad thing when I get newspaper, I just, I feel like crying what is happening in the country right now, and nobody can do nothing about it. Now, what year did you come to the United States? We came 1950, and we came to Amsterdam, there where he was. Mm -hmm. He was a lawyer and uh, lived there with his sister. And when we came to this country, on beginning, I mean, what do you do? So I start working in a shop where they make the... Gloves? The, yeah, and the people were so nice to me. Mm -hmm. Dear God, how those women were nice to me. How they tried... I became great seamstress in two months. Now, how did you meet Myra? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming <laughs> to it. So at the time I was in Europe when I was in college, I was engaged to the guy that was already finishing med medical school. And I mean, he was going to Australia, his sister was a doctor, and uh, they were going to Australia, and I supposed to go with him, and I say, I'm not going, I'm going when my parents are going. Anyway, but he wind up in New York too. But, so when I work in those factories saying of all of a sudden, this lawyer knew somebody that knew somebody that I tried to get into, uh, uh, what's it called, the atomic uh, uh, thing you have in, in Skinny. Oh. Oh, General Electric? General, not General Electric. Yeah, this General Electric. It was, but I needed to be citizen. You have to mm -hmm. be five years to be citizen to get there. No, not General Electric. There is atomic... Uh, uh, let's see, there was, oh, in Melton, Knowles? Uh, yes. Knowles? Yes, at Knowles. But I remember I applied there, but no citizen paper, no way. Then I got the job in a private medical laboratory on Lafayette Street. Mrs. Hart used to be, but she didn't know nothing. I mean, I right away got promoted there so big. So next thing, I couldn't find her on all issues. She's try she was very nice, you know, but her knowledge was not there. She just started this laboratory, you know, like fun doing. And, but as a result, I mean, in totality, the, the laboratories at this time were not, were not still advanced, but they are now, you mm -hmm. know. It was all you count was done, white blood count this, everything, you look at microscope, those days are over. And so I figured I'm not advancing there. I'm gonna, I see they needed somebody in St. Clair's Hospital. 
So I went, it was my birthday. I went there for the interview and he wrote uh, Dr. McGaffey was the pathologist in uh, three hospitals. You know, so scary today, it's like different world. He was pathologist, so he needed somebody that knew the stuff, knew how to make solutions and so on and so forth to run the lab. So I got the job there, and there I really started making money. I used to take whole weekend, 24 hours, two days straight. They gave me room to sleep in, but I'm on a call continuously. It's a surgery, blood mm -hmm. bank, so I used to do everything, chemistry, blood bank, uh, uh, you name it, uh, pathology, bacteriology, all this thing uh, I got involved in. But at this time, I got paid double, you know, and here we have nothing, you know buying uh, the table and chair and the bed mm -hmm. with my parents that are not well. So, uh, oh, then how I met one. So I came to church and the priest in church went to prep school in Przemysl with my father too. <laughs> so, you know, he say, why don't you join the choir? So I come into church and I still was not singing, not singing in choir. When I sit, I come in late, I sit in the back, Myron come in and he stood in front of me. I mean, at the time, I, now I know who, who he was, but at night there was a concert, big concert in singing uh, in a, in a Lithuanian hall, and I was, I was the soloist too, wow. And I remember, you know how the hall is dull dark, the door open, and I see, wow, same guys are staying from the church with me, but this was, you know, there was another person, there was another person, and uh, there was New Year's Eve, and I went to see European movies. You know, I didn't know nobody in the city in this. I come in back and my mother say, there is some guy from RPI coming here already three times and he was the friend of my boyfriend. And he say, he wants you to come to the New Year's Eve party. I say, mother, I don't want to go to those New Year's Eve party. She say, listen, he, we, he woke up, but we living now with my brother and two little kids. Mm -hmm. And he say, he's not, listen, he wake up and woke the kids already three times. Go with him. So I came there and, you know, new girls show up. Everybody want to ask me to, the, everybody ask me to dance. In fact, the Krivulich, you know, yeah. I never forget, he asked me to dance. And John, oh, and John, and John uh, Wills. Wills, he come into, you probably send him. And I see this same guy is sitting there with a cross leg like this, smoking cigarettes, not dancing, just sitting there. I say, oh, they probably this would be guy so that wouldn't bother you. But th this was all, so I went. So there is the concert, I'm coming to the concert, I'm singing in the concert, and after concert, one of the professors, maybe 10, 15 years older than I, asked me to go to movies. And he said, well, quite a gentleman, one of the greatest skiers and one of the greatest tennis players, and I say, listen, we don't have a phone home. I have to go home and tell my mother that I'm going with you to movies. And uh, he say, okay, as we are walking out, there is a, a bar. And I've all of a sudden, his friend called this professor I'm with, Matthew, and say, Matthew, uh, 
Wow, are you tough to talk to? Aren't you going to come in and have a drink with us? And Matthew said to me, Lydia, we have to go. Those are the old immigration. And they would feel it that we feel too, too high and mighty to be mm -hmm. with them. Let's come in this. I never drank, you know. So anyway, I'm here, Matthew here, and here is uh, Moon. Moon, and here is Myron. And Myron not even looking in my direction. And nothing that I, I but I figured, it's the guy, I saw him before, but I mean, I have a boyfriend in New York, so I'm going to marry him. So, um, city, uh, so he say, are you going to have anything to drink? I say, listen, we are going to movies. I, I don't think, maybe I have some soda or something, but uh, we are going to movies. I, I cannot speak still good English uh, at this point at all. And he say, we are going to movies too. Why don't we go together? Moon looks at him. <laughs> Up to now, he's ignoring me, but now that I'm leaving, he's going to movies, too. He said, there is a very good movie, we are Amsterdam, in Schenectady. He said, why don't we go to this movie? It's gonna, we still have time. It's gonna just start four o'clock or something like this. So I look at Matthew, Matthew look at me, he say, what do you say? I say, do we have to? And he say, you know, he has a car, he's going to drive us there like this, we have to walk. He doesn't have still car, I don't have a car. Uh, so, Myron is taking us. He has a, this white convertible uh, with this, so naturally I'm forced to sit in front with him, where two guys, a Moon and this, sitting on the back. So he's very nonchalant, but he said, still too early for a movie. So we passed some place on Route 5, and he said, what we, why don't we stop and have a beer, he said to the guys. And, you know, uh, the, uh, Matthew, one of the greatest uh, gentlemen of the century, very proper, very elegant man, and he say, I mean, we already here, there is no other way we can do. And so we went, uh, went, uh, went uh, inside, and there was a little baby grand piano, and I figured, let those guys talk, and I'm going a little bit, see, or I still remember how to play the shallot, uh, uh, Charlotte Little Concertos. When I finish this, I say we're probably ready to, to uh, say sitting and drinking beer. I come in back and sit between the Matthew and you. And Matthew starts feeling not that he was in any way with me involved, you know. We were just like friends, sing together in a choir and this. Very proper, very great gentleman. You know, like I felt safe going to movies with him or anything. And, but he's kind of, Myron speaks broken Ukrainian and he kind of throws a little, you know, try to embarrass him in some way. And I felt, wow, oh, that's not nice. You know, hey, you don't speak English so good, so don't throw the stones at this guy. So I said something on his behalf. And Matthew said to, Ma to Myron, Myron, in Europe, when the woman would defend you as such, at least you can kiss her hand. Myron looked at him and said, this is what they do in Europe? And he grabbed me and he kissed me. <laughs> Not on him, he kissed me. And I don't know what to say at this point, you know. <laughs> and he said, this, Matthew, how we do in America. <laughs> 
So at this point, I figured there is, we, we never made a movie. One thing led to the other. Then he decided to drop Moon and, and Matthew home. And what, Matthew said to Myron, Myron, you're not going to take Lydia at all, home alone. And he said, don't worry. She's going to be very safe getting there. So he dropped me home and he said to me, I will see you Wednesday. I figured, this guy has a nerve. <laughs> I say, now listen, I'm not seeing you Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. I'm not seeing you. And I got out and I left. What happened? Do we want in this picture? You can continue with the story, but, but towards the end, we'll, we'll look at that okay. picture. So what happened on the end, on Wednesday, um, I'm living in my um, brother place with two little children. I'm on the floor, they sitting on back, and I'm a little horsey walking, entertaining them, till my sister-in-law and my brother come. They'll come back from work. My mother is cooking meal. When Myron walks in and they say, aren't you ready? I say, ah. I didn't say I was going. So all of a sudden, he started conversation with my father. My father, big historian, uh, you know, uh, Latin and all this thing, but this guy is matching him one on one. And my father say, I like this guy. My parents were in love with him first. <laughs> and he say, well, finally you brought it home, the guides don't know what he's talking about. He really knows the history, he really knows everything. And so I say, I'm still not going to movies with him, mother. I don't think it's right, I have a boyfriend there. And my mother say, listen, the kids have gone to sleep. They said, little apartment, what are you gonna, what are you gonna throw him out? Tell him to leave or what? Go to movies with him. So I went to movies with him. Next thing, I'm working on Lafayette Street in this private lab. And I take a bus from there to Amsterdam, from Amsterdam there. And all of a sudden, the phone rings, I answer in, in lab. He said, I happen to be in, in Schenectady. Would you like to ride back with me to Amsterdam? I can give you the ride. I say, you know, I have my tickets already, this, but, but you have to, come on, I drop you right with it. But he would drive right through the mountains there and show me the whole scenery and everything else. And we became kind of like uh, friends. Then my boyfriend wanted me to come to New York. I couldn't leave my parents. We don't, they, we're living with my brother. I need to, I need to get apartment for three of us that we can have, uh, you know, that we can have some life together. I need to buy the bed and this and this. I say, I cannot come. He say, then bring the parents with you. My father, too much of European gentleman to, to accept such a grace. My father say, when you have to go, you go. We stay here. My father had a job as a dishwasher in one of the stores. And uh, so this is how it all went. And next thing I knew, I was seeing him more, and then we see, we, uh, you know, it is, it was, then I moved to the St. Clair's Hospital, and he used to come, before he used to go to General Electric, he used to, uh, to the turbine test department, we, uh, 
he used to he used to work overnight. He used to work the overnight. And he used to sleep where we used to have a frogs for pregnancy. Mm -hmm. There was like a little little loft. <laughs> so to be and I had a whole hospital to myself, but I was taking whole weekends and if he wanted to see me whole weekends he has to come in and sit there with the frogs. <laughs> Stupidly hard. After I finish, I'd like to add something. <laughs> okay. Not now, when I finish. Okay. All right. And oh, did you want to hold up that? Uh, yes. The photographs, and uh, I can zoom in on each one. You can hold it just like that. That's my brother and I, my grand. This is my grandfather. Okay. Your grandfather, and that's your brother in the picture too? No, that, that's my cousin. Okay. And that's my aunt here pondering her nose. Okay. She married a lawyer that was asked to be a president of Ukraine in exile. Okay. And then the next picture? The next picture, it is the fields, the oil fields. Okay, got it. And then here is this resort, famous resort. We used to go for two months. And there is my mother, my brother, little me with a doll, and my uncle. And then there is my brother and me drink. You see, it was like Saratoga where we used to go. And the name was Krenica and they have the mineral waters. And you see two of us sitting here yeah. drinking mineral waters. And there is my father and my mother already in Germany, I think this was. Okay. And there is my mother. She was the first woman in Poland to have the to have the permanent. She was one of the most most elegant dressed women. Wait a minute. The camera started acting up. Okay. I got it. All right. Okay. What I did, you know, those picture in albums, they never they never, they get yellow and everything, so I took all the segments and every, every year, this is this year what I'm sending to my friends, the good times, not the bad times. Oh. Very nice. And uh, you and Myron eventually had children? Yes, we have two of the greatest. We have two of the greatest sons anybody can ask for. Uh, our older son, the one that lives in Paris. And there is my younger son. See if I can zoom in on that. Actually, yeah, if you hold it there. The one in the center? Yes. It's 50th birthday at a track. And his name is? Peter. Peter, okay. And here and is he's Walt. A, he's in the art business. He said, this is the kids that never, he, he became one of the top skier. He was invited to ski with the top in the world. Here's my older son. That's Ed Walter. Walter. Uh, this was uh, Michelle and Reggie Party in the room. Okay. All right, very nice. Um, is there anything else uh, we missed that maybe you'd like to add to the interview? Uh, I mean, uh, the only thing we are so fortunate.
to live in this country. And I wish that more people would, would, would understand that. You know, when I hear anything, anybody saying anything bad about it, it really hurts me. Mm -hmm. But being born to such a freedom and a good life, what this country provides for people, uh, I don't know how anybody can say anything bad about it. You, you have to live through experiences, not just the war, but living through experiences in other countries. Mm -hmm how limited they are, even progre how progressive they are, but how limited they are on different things. But here, you can come with, you can come with nothing. And when you really interested to work and progress, you can do it. This is amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I say, you, look at my life. I, I was born to very wealthy parents. We lost it, everything. Then I built it uh, with my husband some, some, uh, some little comfortable living. Then we had a fire and lost it, everything. <laughs> you know, to redo things like this in life that so is very, very tough. But still, it's possible only in this country. I don't think only by some sheer luck, but by hard work, you can achieve anything here. Okay, thank you so much for your interview. Yeah, sure. Very well said. <laughs>